Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Emlin, Director of Customer Success. Uh, welcome to the webcast. Uh, we will be starting uh, almost immediately, quite shortly. I uh, just want to welcome Adam Kruzinski uh, with me as well. Um, and we'll get into formal uh, introductions later. Um, and so let's get underway. So the topic is best practices for combining waterfall and agile project management. So as we introduced the topic, if you could go uh, start using specific words, specific phrases to describe project management practice in your organization. Again, you're entering single words, three single words to describe. And as, as everyone is entering those, we'll be able to see what, uh, what, uh, what's it like for everyone. From my point of view, the, the topic is a, it's a very common topic. There's a lot of organizations that are, that are both predictive and responsive. There are some that, um, you know, the, the financial cycle is predictive, the portfolio, the product cycle is, 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 is predictive, but they increasingly want to use agile practices and to be more responsive, to be able to pivot more often, to be able to change priorities and to respond to opportunities faster. So uh, this idea of combining is very fresh. And one of the stats that we use in the session is from PM Solutions, 84% of our organizations are, are embracing this hybrid models, these uh, adaptive models of, 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 of using both. Steve, how about you? Yeah, I think, I mean, just um, um, actually looking at some of the the words that have been used so far, um, they're all actually quite uh, positive. Um, so I can tell we've got some easy projects customers here. Um, but again, I think Adam, you nailed it on the head when it's, um, there is still a, a large question about maybe there are some legacy um, practices around waterfall and there is interest in developing more of an agile methodology and combining those two is kind of the less frontier. So I think it's a very apt talk, topic for us. Um, and also just wanted to mention for anybody who's joined perhaps a bit late, um, as Adam mentioned before, um, if you want to go to the website at the top, uh, www.menti.com and use the code that we have there, um, you can participate in the session as we have uh, some people doing already. Yeah, this will, this will be a lot more fun. And again, this is a way for not only for us to share, but for you to share. So uh, the code will continue being up as we go through the content. Um, as far as objectives for the session, so we have four that we perceive to be the most important ones. So we do want to use the session to share best practices. We want to use the session to inform each other, not only us informing you, but also inform each other. You know, there's going to be quite a number of participants. Uh, as you're voting and as you're engaging, it would be really useful to know from each other where everybody is, is at. Uh, we want to wrestle with this topic, so we've probably allocated just as much time in the discussion as we have in the content presentation. Um, and we want to walk out with specific actionable insights, the soft stuff that you can use tomorrow, day after. Um, I think that's the one of the key reasons why we're here. Okay, and in terms of logistics, guys, so uh, what you can expect throughout the session. Um, as we've mentioned and demonstrated already, so it is definitely an interactive session. Um, if you are having any issues with the session itself, or you're not able to uh, hear us, um, or you're not seeing the screen, um, you can use the, the chat window to let us know uh, if you're having any issues. Um, we um, will be collecting, or we'll be uh, having you be interactive through the session, but do uh, rest assured that it's uh, the results are without names. So. Um, you can be fully yourself, fully um, uh, uh, open and honest about your practices um, without having to worry. Uh, there will be a Q&A per section. So uh, we, as Adam mentioned, we do want this to be a balanced uh, approach where, you know, everyone is sharing and uh, everyone is learning. And then finally, we are recording the session. And so it will be made available to all the participants uh, after it's complete. And then also um, at the bottom right corner, you'll notice that there are a few buttons. Uh, if you really love something, click on the heart. If you have a question, you can also click on the uh, question mark. Uh, thumbs up, thumb down. And then we've got the cat face for uh, I'm not amused. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> so yeah, we have specific content slides, 
situation when we share best practices where you could use these types of votes to tell us, yeah, I'm a line or I'm not a line. Uh, okay, so let's go. So first we have a few slides uh, for us to get to know each other. We, let, we want to capture some information about you and we'll also share some more detailed introductions about ourselves. And again, uh, if you haven't already, use the address on top of the slide, go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use code 63606. This is uh, how you'll be able to enter your information and participate in a far more engaged way. So let's, uh, let's start with getting to know each other. So first question for you, what department team do you represent here? And it's okay if it's multiple. So you're welcome to select multiple departments teams, but we, we want to get an understanding. Are we speaking to marketers? Are we speaking to uh, IT people? If you can give us some idea of who are the main participants here so that we can tailor what we share to you. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple, uh, couple minutes. Okay, so we have some a lot of others. We have marketers. We have a number of people from PMO. I'm curious what all the others are, mm -hmm. what, what division we missed. So maybe can I ask you to maybe message, if you could, if you could message in the chat for the meeting. Okay, so I see more marketers now, more, more information technology. Okay, maybe let's, let's keep going for the next question. So we're getting some, uh, some feedback. So we're, it's actually quite a bit of design. So instructional design, uh, consulting, oh, nice. instructional design. Yeah, so. Okay, cool. Very Consultant will come up here. So now that's the second one. What is your role? If you can give us an idea, we want to know, are you internal, external? Are you uh, a project manager? Yeah. Are you a consultant? Again, we can use this to decide on how to tailor the content, what, what we're going to talk about. So this is really interesting. We have 63% project managers. Okay, we have some consultants. I'm going to wait for a few more votes. I mean, we have a, a wide area uh, area that we're covering. It's a, mm -hmm. um, some of the insights are more relevant to different types of roles. And the kind of last question is, how does project management feel like in your organization right now? And this is maybe a little more fun, or it could be therapeutic, depending how you look at it. And you can choose multiple things here as well. If you if you if you're being honest and transparent. Tell me what does project management feel like to you right now in your organization? Okay, good. We've got some number of votes for teamwork, endless meetings, so high level of collaboration. A lot of you say, you know, there's a lot of meetings, and we have some people that say, okay, it's a factory line or constant mass. That's uh, that's that. Okay, that gives us a, a good idea of how we're going to work. Uh, you know, how we're going to position the content. Let's keep going. So quick intro on myself, you know, pass on to Steve. Uh, I'm co-founder of Business Transformation Lead for a company called Value Transform. Value Transform helps organizations evolve. So basically looks at best uh, practices, operating processes, approaches that Fortune 500 companies use and we create workshops and training that then allow regular companies, any company really to adopt those, those, those practices really quickly within days, not months. So I'm gonna summarize that. How about you, Steve? Yep, so uh, Director of Customer Success here at Easy Projects. Um, if you don't know me and you're an Easy Projects customer, shame on you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, uh, over my last three years of being with the company, um, have certainly, um, Learned a lot about uh, the various, um, the variety of our customer base. And so um, I'm very interested to seeing how this applies to them today. Just to dive in into the, uh, the actual topic. So a lot of organizations call this hybrid, hybrid project management or adaptive project management. There's actually multiple uh, ways to, to understand how companies or organizations mix predictive and responsive approaches. So I have a few to kind of, uh, uh, I have this image to kind of explain the difference. Adaptive is where somewhere between portfolio program planning, there you're combining the predictive and responsive 
uh, approaches. So you, as in your portfolio planning, your business is predictive, and then your program level planning, when is something going to be done? And execution is now agile. Uh, so that's what typically is referred to as adaptive. Parallel is when you have simply some projects are run entirely in waterfall or PMI, and some projects are run entirely in agile. That's parallel, and basically, you know, the specific types of activities, or could be specific teams even, are run in one or the other. Hybrid is uh, this idea that you want to combine the best of both worlds or the best of both practices, and it, it, it is somewhat unexplored. It is. It is sort of like, okay, how do we mix these two approaches? How do we, can we do waterfall and agile? What does that look like? And this is where all projects have a set common of processes or artifacts, but those artifacts are mixed between uh, waterfall or predictive approaches and agile or responsive approaches. So for example, I'm gonna have a project plan and a project manager, but I'm executing as a scrum team. Um, and I showed the last one, the last one is complete. Complete is really a commentary on the fact that the, there's extremely few organizations that can run the business at a responsive level. Doesn't matter if you do not use any waterfall or predictive uh, uh, approaches. Reality is that your taxes are hired annually. Your financial planning is done annually. Your budgeting is done annually often. Uh, so there, there's still a predictive aspect to how you run a business, even if everything else is, is responsive. And I think this is one, this is one of the reasons why the statistic comes in from PM Solutions, where 84% of organizations combine, mm -hmm. somehow combine, in one of these versions, combine the two approaches. But the reality is there aren't necessarily good frameworks that tell you how to combine them well. So very few companies actually combine these properly. And certainly not in a way that is sustainable. Uh, so this this is really about what are the best practices when you are combining these two, and then is there a good framework uh, for that? Um, okay, so let's start with a question. And we're going to do this for a lot of sections. We're going to go section by section. Within each section, we're going to have a question. I'm just curious if you want to vote. Is this 84% true for you? So I'm curious for the people that are here, that are listening, you know, are your organization mixing these practices? So I have a scale here. The left side you have, hey, we're using predictive waterfall PMI. Right side we have, no, we're using responsive agile scrum. And I want you to place the dot either closer to the right or closer to the left in terms of, okay, project intake and approval. Are you doing it more predictive? Or are you doing it more responsive? PMO or program level planning. Or imagine a roadmap. Are you doing it in responsive or are you doing it in predictive? Project planning or even scoping, what the work is. You know, how are you doing it? And then managing execution. And the last two is, if you can give me an idea of what percentage of projects are managed in this way that you've described now. So what percentage of projects are agile, then you drag it on the right. So basically if you you drag it halfway between this midpoint and agile, that means 75% of the projects are done in, in agile. And then in the future, what are you planning to do? And what, what, what does that look like? Now, I know that's a, a more complex question. So it's gonna take you a little longer to answer, but uh, I have a prediction that I'm gonna share later because I don't wanna in, influence the votes. But I mean, if, we can already see that there is a, there, there, no one is extremely on the right or extremely on the left. So that means everyone is somehow mixing practices. So right now, at this point, while people are voting, we have uh, a lot of people are doing predictive for project and taking approval, and that makes sense. As far as planning against excuse to predictive, so program level planning, road mapping, as far as project specific planning, again, skews predictive. Uh, now I bet you as we go to execution, we'll skew the other way. Yeah, so how we plan is a response to just the cadence of the organization, but now how we wanna execute is gonna skew on the agile. So execution is now skewed higher on agile. 
as far as where people are right now, so we can see here, we're skewed on Agile. So ma majority of the projects from, majority of the work is executed in an Agile way. And it's interesting because in the future, it's a more distributed. Right? so in here we had four and three. What, I'm, what we're seeing is part of that three is moving over to the, to the more uh, traditional project management. So it's a bigger mix. The four seems to still be there, and then my guess is. Hmm. All right, so, so that was one of my prediction. My predictions is that the planning, because it's 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 typically follows an organizational cycle, is more predictive. And while more and more our organizations will be adopting the agile practices in the future. Okay, but I don't see a single one that is doing just one way. So all of you are currently combining. Sorry, I have one that is um, one in here, and two in here, but I bet you're still doing, yeah, you're still doing a planning this way. Okay, interesting. Okay, so sounds like for us, the statistic holds. Okay, cool. So let's keep going and, and we're gonna introduce the first section. Um, the first one is about, uh, one of the best practices is about aligning both methods to the same business value. Uh, and before we start talking about this, this topic, we do want to ask you questions so we can better uh, decide what we're going to talk about, right? So we want to know which of these issues are the biggest issues for you. And when we present the solutions, when we present the recommendations, we will be focusing on the ones that are really Im important to you. Now, in this case, I'm not showing you each other's your results yet. I'm going to see the votes coming in. And only when we have a specific number of votes will I show, will I reveal the results. I simply don't want to skew the results. So go ahead and vote. And this is about, okay, when it comes to clarity, clarity of objectives of KPIs in your hybrid project management and, and, and environment. Project status, is there lack of clarity, consistency, or is there great clarity and consistent, con consistency? And, and if you can use again the dot to kind of vote on that. How about progress of work? Progress of work, is there, when you receive that, stat, that information, is there a lot of clarity or is inconsistency or is there uh, very little clarity and, and, and consistency? Next one is project status. So not progress of work, but status, how's the project doing? Um, and the last two I'm more particularly interested in, as far as for this project, were the business objectives achieved? And was the re revenue met or return on investment met? Do you have that information for your projects? Is that clear? Is that information consistent? Um, so I'm going to vote till we get maybe a couple more votes and I'm going to show the, the results. Again, this, our, our insights that we're going to share and our, our, our recommendations are in these areas. So I want to make sure that we're going to focus on the right thing for you here. So let's see what everybody's voting at. So for project status, we have a <laughs> split. We have a half that say, hey, we have a good consistency or maybe not perfect consistency. We have a half that, no, it's not, it's not doing well. Progress of work, a lot of you, okay, you're doing well. You have eight of you that says, okay, we can clearly see how the project is tracking. Project success, that's a more dis distributed vote. But we're still skewing on the right side, which is good. And the business objectives, uh, somewhat of a split. And I'm curious, we're gonna ask later, I'll, I'll ask you later if the people that voted on great clarity, whether you're using predictive or whether you're using adaptive methods, and the people that voted the four that are right here on the left for business objectives achieved are using again predictive or responsive methods. Uh, and, 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 and ROI is again distributed, but it's even more on the left. So let's, let's enter the topic. Sure. So um, I guess we wanted to quickly clarify why. 
um, it's important to align both, method, both methods to the same uh, business value and KPIs. Um, and I think it's oftentimes, I mean, the answer is quite simple. Oftentimes both approaches exist within the same um, separate organizational silos and the resultant business value and KPIs are often quite different. Um, and so when it comes to combining any aspect of this um, and trying to seek some sort of uniformity, it becomes a complex bowl of spaghetti um, and understanding any sort of real uh, overall status, value results becomes uh, quite difficult. And so aligning and then going through this exercise will provide purpose clarity to reduce the complexity of integrating both methods. Um, so why do, why do we do the things we do? Um, single vision will provide a single dimension compared to, to compare the success of both methods. So a single source of truth um, said differently. And it will simplify reporting and make the reporting more meaningful and actionable. Um, I think these are obviously all um, good ends to themselves and um, clarify why we should seek to, to do this. Okay, so let's jump into the recommendations. So, uh, just give me a sec. There we go. Record number one. It's as far as the key KPIs, again, we want to use a single KPI for all frameworks in here. And the recommendation here is not to use the idea of scope uh, because the scope creates a wrong behavior. You want someone to deliver the business objectives, not the scope. The scope is actually a proxy for, uh, and it represents business objective. And so it's a proxy KPI. You want to get the root KPI. The root KPI is percentage of business objectives delivered to the customer as a result of this project. Don't use the scope, don't use the, 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 the proxy. Uh, again, this is one metric, can be used for both Agile and Waterfall projects. Next KPI. Uh, when, again, when you have an increasing number of projects that have unknowns that are difficult to predict, the more meaningful metric is not time, not being on time, but speed to market, or how quickly can we complete something? Uh, when you have a perfect plan and a predictable timeline and you, it's reliable, then the, the timeline is representative of what you will likely achieve. And that's great. When you have projects that are disruptive, when you have uh, unknowns, that KPI stops making sense. And in fact, the on time actually creates a lot of behavior. The on time creates a behavior was like, maybe I could be earlier but my mentality, it's not about being earlier. My mentality is I'm going to hit that date. And that's what will create a bottleneck. So again, use a different KPI instead of use, how quickly can I get this to the market? How quickly can I get this complete? How quickly can I get this to the customer as a KPI measure? And this will create the attitude of, okay, it doesn't matter what the project timeline is. Can we do it faster? Can we change it? Can we, same thing if you come across unknowns, issues, risks. The question is, not okay, how do we, shuffle stuff around so we meet that deadline and then typically you shorten QA cycles or something else. The question is always, okay, no, what is the fastest way for us to get this value to the customer? Uh, so that's number two measure. Number three measure, and again, <clears throat> all three of these will apply to both frameworks and will create a nice simple consistency. Uh, last one is don't do on budget, do based on ROI. So this project, what return on investment did it bring? Again, budget creates the wrong behavior where you're trying to hit a specific target, which is a, 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 an artificial target that you created with limited information. The idea is, is no matter where the project is at, how can we maximize the ROI by increasing the opportunity or decreasing the, uh, the, the effort? So that's a con that should be a constant question. So those are three simple ways how you can evolve your KPIs for all projects, no matter what framework you use. Uh, next topic is implement shared planning and portfolio planning, a shared program and portfolio planning. This is one of best practices, again, for combining the two frameworks. Again, we started with a question. Let's see where everybody's at. So again, does your organization consistently practice any of these? 
Left side, we have, no, we don't, or it's not successful. On the right side, we have, yes, we do, and it is very successful. So, does your organization successfully manage multi-project portfolio or program roadmaps? So, it, it, do you guys have a roadmap that shows all the projects, for, for example, or the entire portfolio? Uh, do you have a shared program planning session where all the project managers or the PMO team comes together and, and meets together, uh, maybe quarterly, to plan all the work together? Next one is shared share team capacity planning. So do you have a shared session where you plan the capacity for different teams that may affect each other? Next question, do, we have, do you have a PMO office that manages cross project dependencies? Uh, project management office, whether it's a traditional or whether it's an agile product management office. Uh, and then do you do project update sessions? Do you sync, do all your project managers sync on a regular basis? Uh, or maybe the sync is with, with, with the directors on how everybody's doing. Um, yeah, I'm gonna give you, so we got eight votes. Let's see a few more. Okay, we got 10. So let's start looking at these results. Okay, so roadmaps. Okay, great. Okay, so a lot of you are doing some type of road mapping tool when it's annual. Uh, okay, that's one of the key things, especially when you're using multiple frameworks. Next one is, uh, is there a session? Is there a regular session, like a quarterly session? And here we have, oh, we have four people that are saying, yes, it's worked, we have it, it's successful. So that skews really high. Okay, so the one of the, that's another practice here that you guys are using already, hey, a, a quarterly planning session of some kind. Capacity planning, we have a bit of a split. Maybe it's not shared, maybe you guys do it, but it's not shared. As far as PMO, looks like there's a split as well. Mm -hmm. Pretty even now, three, two, and four, one. So five on one side, five on the other. So some of you have PMO office, and some of you do not. And update meetings. Yeah, so a lot of companies have the either weekly or biweekly status meetings. Uh, they, they exist in, in both frameworks. Okay, cool. So you guys are already doing a lot of what we're going probably to discuss here. Maybe we'll, we'll give you some tips here that you haven't thought about. Um, so let me just explain why this, this, these types of activities are important, especially when you have both frameworks. So. First of all, they facilitate and accelerate cross-team execution. So they are not simply, they become not simply a way to get status, but they actually facilitate conversations and information exchange. Um, the more cross-team execution you have, the more of value this is. Next one is doing these activities, having these roadmaps increases visibility. And visibility then gives you faster response time. So seeing roadmap on a regular basis, knowing status of the projects you're dependent on, that some another project manager is, 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 is managing, allows you to respond faster, manage the delays risk faster. And last one is reduces complexity and effort required to manage multiple competing timelines. So it's supposed to be these activities doing ad hoc. Hey, I'm a project manager, I'm going to another project manager because um, I have a delay and it impacts that person. And then I yet ha I have another meeting with a different project manager, tell them how it impacts that meeting. Imagine having those meetings as shared meetings and what is sharing at the same time. There's a single roadmap, single source of in information. So that's the why. Okay, so um, now that I think the, the why is pretty well understood, self-evident. Um, now we get on to kind of the how. So the first recommendation is a single cross project roadmap. So um, for the purposes of the slide and discussion, we've, uh, we've decided to um, show that using a Gantt chart. Um, and so you can see at a high level, um, the you know, a roadmap showing all the timelines for all the projects down to the phase level. Um, obviously a dynamic Gantt chart like the one in EP is pretty awesome because you can then, um, you know, really specify and filter and, and get the, uh, the appropriate view that you want um, for that roadmap view. Um, secondly, I would highlight the, the importance of clearly showing all the dependencies between all the projects. 
Um, and so any risks um, can be identified, uh, timelines, all of that good stuff, all in one um, overarching view. And then finally, showing milestones um, affecting multiple projects um, is certainly uh, useful, beneficial, and recommended. Okay, second recommendation. Um, to achieve the benefits of planning um, at the program and portfolio level is to hold monthly cross-team project update um, timelines, uh, syncs. And um, so that, you know, meetings aren't always bad, um, especially with the right tools and the right methodology. And so the recommendation here is it's absolutely necessary to stay on track um, with highly integrated projects. You simply cannot um, allow your project managers to go wandering around in the forest. Um, you know, there has to be a check-in. Um, the fastest and most efficient way to get all your projects and teams aligned, uh, provided you have a simple roadmap like we just talked about. And so um, it keeps the meetings on topic uh, and it keeps everything aligned. And then finally, the most efficient way to share project status and manage changes. Um, done in person, um, we can be certain of alignment. Any sort of a conflict can be um, dealt with quickly um, and with agreement. Uh, so we can move on to the next phase of execution and keep the project moving with greater certainty. And the last one, I know I'm going to have to explain a bit. Uh, it's the idea of having project web limits. Uh, web limits is something that's common in, uh, more common in Agile, but uh, and here we're talking about different types of web limits. We're talking about web limits to projects, number of projects run at the same time. Um, and this one is about just managing complexity, especially when you're using multiple frameworks. Uh, we're talking about limiting number of projects. Uh, typically, you run projects based on a, a market end date or a target date, and that's what's driving when is the project being executed. The idea here is that to minim uh, Minimize number of projects that you do at the same time, therefore reducing complexity of work, therefore re reducing complexity and risks associated with flipping between flipping uh, between the projects, resource flipping. Um, so again, not always possible, but if it is possible, schedule project timelines based on related business value. Again, back to the first point, look at all the projects that are focusing on the same business value, try to group them, deliver them together around that business value and then defer other ones that are delivering different business value. Um, do them in batches, again, fewer, so you have less switching, you have less wait and go, especially when you have dependencies. So the, the more projects are dependent on, on each other, the, the more they should be run together and you should be limiting this uh, interference and destructions and impediments from other projects. Um, again, this, some of our risks are the switching risk. Some of our complexity of doing projects together using multiple frameworks is just the fact that we're trying to do too much at the same time, too many projects at the same time. So you're not decreasing how long something is going to take, the amount of effort that the project has. You're simply decreasing how, much, how many projects you're doing at the same time, and you're reducing that type of complexity. Um, so that is the third record. And again, if you guys, if this doesn't make sense, or if you want to ask me questions about it, next topic is unifying your intake process. Uh, okay, let's start with, in this case, it's not a sliding scale. It's more about use three words to describe your current intake approval and prioritization process. Okay, let's see some other votes. Messy, inconsistent. Okay, keep voting. We only have two votes, but there's a theme already. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had some more. Mm. Workable, tactical, tactical, 
chaotic. <laughs> because it's confusing. It's very repeats. Consistent. Okay, let's maybe get a couple more votes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's definitely a theme going on here. So I'm glad that we're doing this section. It mm -hmm. was very relevant. Yes. We get another cumbersome data intensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of your comments that I often get is I mean, the amount of information that has to be entered. Hard to read. Okay, it's a common theme. So let's keep going. Oh, there was somebody else that just entered. <laughs> Too late. All right, so let's talk about why you should do it. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, um, it's pretty common sense and straightforward that um, in seeking to unify your process, your uh, your project management practices, that your intake process should be uh, should be unified. Um, you'll find that it, you know, project intake delays are um, significantly increase the execution costs and risks. Um, a streamlined intake process will allow you to jump on new opportunities um, that you would have missed with a slower, less efficient uh, process. Um, and finally, something that's pretty straightforward, the intake process is purely operational in terms of its cost. Um, and that should always, um, you should always seek to minimize that. Um, again, you know, my, my feeling from a, from a product perspective is that the tools are there uh, in order to, to uh, allow this to happen. Um, and so we should uh, seek to take advantage of them. All right, so uh, first recommendation. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, step one, just create a single project request form and triage. Um, so get started. The form shouldn't cater to every corner case. And I have seen forms that do cater to every corner case and they are not functional. Uh, some of the best forms that I've ever seen um, you know, as Adam pointed out before, you probably don't have all the information at initiation. So let, get it started. Uh, you'll end up with analysis paralysis, and that's not even great. Um, a simple, accessible, and easy to use form will remove any barriers from the business owner. Um, so uh, without that, you'll delay um, the intake of the project. So you, got, you have to minimize that barrier, make sure that it's available, it's simple, um, and it's elegant. And um, if you can't simplify the intake, then you, um, you probably got an overly complex uh, processes for your, um, for your various methodologies. So if you can't combine them and you can't intake them in the same place, then you need to go back and take a look at your, your processes. Okay, record number two. So you have, once you have simplified the one intake is to have an uh, shared, informed, ROI, go, no, go decision, uh, prioritization approach. Uh, in this case, there is a this hesitation or this tendency to say, okay, the ROI is different or the go, no, go should be different if it's a wonderful project or an agile project. Even if that's the case, even if that's true, you want to, this is one of the places where you want to simplify your world and you want to simplify the two approaches by saying, okay, there is no difference in terms of ROI between project being executed in Agile versus PMI. There's, it's, not going to be, it's not going to be executed for less money, for example. This will simplify the calculations for you. If you don't do this, what's going to happen is you're going to create a new administrative processes that are, are going to make it unsustainable. They're, they're, they're not going to give you the value. The process itself is going to be too costly. It won't, than the money that is going to save you. So assume that you don't have to worry, is this a waterfall project, is this an agile project? Assume that the ROI is uniform. Uh, next, kind of obvious uh, common sense, assess validity of the project before involving the team and keep the costs slow. And I know here there's not, there, there, there is not a tendency where, okay, we don't have all the information. So you want to go to the team and get all the information. And that would be great if you could get all the information. It would be great if the information would be highly accurate, it would be a, a good, reliable predictor of what it's going to be. And here we're not saying you cannot involve specific people, knowledgeable people from the execution teams. Uh, we're simply saying don't test the project 
by initiating the project and getting phase one. Do the validity, ascertain ROI, even if it's an incomplete or inaccurate, before you then go to the team and release that project. This is part of financial responsibility. This is part of how you're going to test. I, and then here I have good news and bad news. The bad news is you do not have an accurate way of predicting your ROI. We talked about it earlier. And the good news is that you are equally inaccurate in predicting ROI for all the projects. So while you will not be able to have a certainty, this is the ROI that this project will bring, you will be able, or you should be able to say that this project relatively has more ROI than another project. And the last recommendation here is you have to, you know, there's all of these ROI evaluations, there's multiple factors involved. You have to have single clear way to articulate what that ROI is, what the priority is. And in here we're saying use a proxy value, use a priority and numerical value as a proxy value of business. And it will represent the ROI, will represent the business value. This will allow and facilitate and expedite, more importantly, expedite team level decisions. So when they have multiple projects and they're trying to reconcile or make a decision on how to manage complexity dependencies, as opposed to going up the chain every single time to get a decision, it's having something like a priority, having something like a numerical proxy for business value will allow them to make these decisions faster without escalating every time, which will save you time, money, and will allow you to move faster. So that is the second recommendation here. Uh, and, and and again, uh, ideally you use the same platform that you done the intake through. There is a way how that project is represented and there's a way how you can put a priority on that project in the platform. Because the next recommendation is make that information transparent, make the information accessible. Uh, how did that, you know, what is the score that the, uh, that the project got? What is the ROI that the project got? What is the priority of the project got? Did the project get approved or not approved? Make that information transparent and accessible. Uh, when your projects have ambiguity and you have, they have unknowns, information becomes a very important currency. It is how you make decisions when you don't have all the information in here. So fragmentation of the information is a huge risk and it will create project delays, costs. So in here, don't fragment the, the information, make everything visible especially when you have highly integrated projects, especially when you have highly integrated teams, so that you sh there should never be a scenario where one team member does not know what the priority is or what is the expected return on this project. Make access to the project information also very open, very accessible, very transparent. In some cases, if you're working a lot with vendors, with third parties, um, you know, consider them as another team member or as another team. Can, can they have access to your system? Can they have all the documentation? Can they see the priority? Can use the same information to make the decisions? Last one is, uh, and this is one of the complexities when you're using hybrid project management, because both approaches have different uh, documentation, right? So you have a project plan, but you also have stories. Um, the principle that we want to use here to navigate that complexity is to simply perceive documentation as having value directly related to the business value. So in terms of, do you create a specific document? Yes or no? It's not an aspect of a process, or it's not an aspect of, hey, in the waterfall we do, or in Agile we do. It's more of, does it have value to the project? Does it have value to the business outcome? Use that to decide, do I need this documentation, or how long does that be, okay? So let's say you, you have a project plan. Can a project plan be used in for agile projects? Yeah, agile projects a lot sometimes use uh, lean business cases. Now, in terms of what information is contained between the two documents, is more about what is valuable, what is necessary for the project, what what will is meaningful to deliver business value. So, if you're trying to decide what information to capture, go back to the value. Don't try to say. Uh, uh, dog, almost dog, dogmatically, I have a project charter, I need this section. Let the business value direct you in what you need or what you don't need. So next topic is about 
how do you evolve and integrate project reporting, project process, project success reporting across the two frameworks? How, you know, how, uh, how, uh, what's the best way to, to do that? And again, we're gonna start with a quick questionnaire, see where, where everybody's at. So does your organization consistently practice any of these? On the left side, again, we have, no, we don't, or it's not successful. On the right side, we have, yes, we do, and it is successful. So does the organization uh, consistently practice single executive report or a dashboard that shows progress status for all projects? So like a one page that says, okay, here's how all the projects are doing. Next item, does your organization provide weekly by weekly project status updates to all stakeholders? They could be emails, they could be via dashboard, they could be a page, um, whatever it is. But, you know, is there a place where I as a stakeholder can go to and look at, okay, here is where these projects are at. Next one, uh, in the reports, do we use consistent project KPIs, no matter which PM methodology is used. So do we simplify this conversation, this information to the stakeholders by using the same KPI and then for, you know, status or progress and, and, and no matter what the project is, no matter what approach you use. Next one is to use a platform that can easily, as in with little, with little effort, automate these reports for you so you don't go crazy. The next one is, do your project reports provide meaningful insights and are they effectively used for decision making? So you as a stakeholder, do you trust this data? Do you rely on this data? Do you make significant decisions on this data? And you believe, yeah, this is, this is, this is working. This is really great. Um, either to provide direction back to the project managers, but also to evolve your roadmaps. So we've got six answers. I'm gonna wait till we get 10 uh, before, uh, before I'm gonna reveal their results. All right, let's see where we land. So uh, most of us have single dashboard, one page for all reports, great. Uh, next answer, okay, most of us also have some kind of status updates with all stakeholders on the weekly or bi-weekly, great. Next one is, do we have consistent KPIs? This one is more dis dis distributed, but we have a decent number. That is, uh, yes, we do. It's interesting, only this one do we have a good number of people on the right side, only on the first one. Okay, next one is, looks very similar. It's also quite distributed. Let's just for this in five and one. So most of you have a platform where you can automate these, these reports and then this one this one is always tricky. We get reports, but we sometimes simply don't trust it. We need uh, It's as if either we don't trust the data that was entered, or there is a delay in information, or the quantitative uh, flag, like, hey, green, yellow, red, or the percentage of completion. It's not meaningful. It's not giving you the full story, uh, which is often the case where you have ambiguity in a project, where that or you have unknowns or high risks, that single number of progress is not necessarily meaningful. Okay, so we're back to asking the why question before answering the how question. Um, and so why should you evolve and integrate your project progress and success reporting um, when combining? Uh, I mean, it's pretty, it, again, I'm gonna say it's pretty straightforward. Um, as your project complexity increases, um, it requires faster decision-making. So you need that information um, that comprehensive information to um, make the proper, the appropriate decisions to uh, allow for success and uh, mitigate risk. Um, Real-time reporting um, empowers better cross-project and vendor dependency management. Um, so if you're able to have that data at your fingertips without having to wait for your spreadsheet guru to download and, you know, uh, populate 17 uh, different sheets, and run a space shuttle-like uh, spreadsheet, um, you can certainly um, have better cross-project and vendor dependency management. And then finally, uh, so it, again, self-evident, spending less time on project uh, reporting means you can do more, you can execute more, and we should all want that. Um, ah, this is my favorite. So, um, 
keep it simple, Stephen. Uh, well, we won't use any cuss words. Um, so <laughs> I've, uh, um, we'll go with some tested acronyms. So less is more, um, one page, simple, clear cross project report. Um, so at a glance, you should be able to um, sense the direction and understand the direction of the projects. And from there, if you want to drill down and, and you want to um, get to a different level of the data, you want to go down to the project level, you want, want to go down to a portfolio level, feel free. But um, at, its, you know, at its top level, you should have a clear, concise report. Um, focus on fewer KPIs rather than um, an exhaustive number of KPIs because quite frankly, one, they change so fast that they'll be out of date by the time that you've gotten to the list of, you know, at the, the list of 50 KPIs that you track. And two, um, you can't make sense of it. So you should trust fewer KPIs and the accuracy of those. And then finally, uh, something that I think everybody should, should pay credence to um, is make it accessible. So make it um, whatever your means of making it accessible is email, dashboards, television screens, uh, carrier pigeon. Uh, <laughs> do what you need to do to get the information into the hands of the people that need it, into the decision makers' hands. Okay, we've got some uh, thumbs up here. Mm -hmm. And hearts, oh Thanks. wow, okay, cool. So this is this one. This one dives more into the, the simplicity versus frequency. So again, we tend to make decisions based on few KPIs, especially uh, uh, we try to manage ambiguity by adding new measures and that actually tends to not to provide you can't quantify a certain certain risk or certain um, um, ambiguity here so that the, the the practice here or the recommendation here is more frequent updates more frequent circulation on fewer kpis so more real-time data get access to information as quickly as possible on a fewer and more accurate pieces of information that are really the key information that you use to make decisions as opposed to sharing all the KPIs to somehow give someone an idea of the ambi ambi unambiguous, sorry, ambiguous aspect, okay? Uh, and instead, for the ambiguous aspect, use comments. So this is the second bullet here is, mm -hmm. The ambiguity aspect, the risk aspect, don't use measures, don't use specific numbers to address those, to answer those. Allow the project manager or the team to enter specific qualitative comments. That's how you have the balance of the, of the, of the information. So you have a few KPIs, updated frequently, ideally it's automated, it's available real time, and the qualitative information about the risks, unknowns, this, uh, things like that, use comments for that. Uh, and then the last recommendation here is pick a date, pick a specific date, similar principle that people have for status, project status meetings once a week. Imagine all the information come out on the same day. So all the updates coming out on the same day, it uh, as opposed to getting information fragmented and you're being, you're being forced to connect it or using the time to ask for the additional information. Imagine all the statuses coming out at the same time whether it's in the morning or whether it's a weekly PL saying, um, that way people can act at the same time, they can sync at the same time. Uh, same thing with doing a dashboard, you know, every morning, 8 a.m., the dashboard's updated, everybody can go and then everybody can, can sync. I suppose to doing it at different times. Uh, so that's the second record. Third record is automate. <laughs> so if you think about this, uh, this, the reporting itself is not the most useful thing that the project manager can do. There are far more important things that they could do. In fact, reporting is something that you should be able to automate. So the PMO can spend more time on valuable activities and strategic activities. So ideally you do use an integrated platform. This is where you, you want to use a platform that can work with, you know, if you have one system for your project management for both agile and waterfall, that's great. There's a very few of them. If you're using two systems, one for waterfall, one for agile, that's fine. If you have a single reporting system like Power BI, Power BI is not, not one, not the only one, but there's a number of them. Uh, you want to integrate system for their reporting aspect. Again, ideally it's a real time in integration. And ideally it is, again, automated, okay? This reduces complexity of reports, reduces the amount of data being captured, so the effort and you're instead prioritizing accuracy for key KPIs to getting more 
frequently, ideally real time. So, so that is the, the third record here, already a three. So last one is reduced waste complexity via simplification and automation. So this applies to everything. Uh, let's do it just a few minutes. Uh, in your organization, do you practice project process, project uh, aptus resorts, are they automated, are they accurate? Monthly quarter and monthly or quarterly work on simplifying PM, PMO processes. Do you, do you guys actually look at how do you simplify your processes on a regular basis? Do you repurpose the same meeting for all projects or do you have separate project meetings? So for example, kickoff. Do you do kickoff for every project when you have 300 projects? Or do you repurpose one meeting for kickoff for all projects? Um, next one is, do you try to fix people issues with workflow or documentation? Uh, we'll talk about that later and Next one is kind of an interesting one. Uh, do you believe that your PMs, your PMO, have time to contribute to strategy and provide real business value, or are they too busy managing tasks, reports, and so, so forth? I'm gonna start showing right away. And for those of you that have, that have, to, that have to go, because it's three o'clock, again, the session is recorded, so you'll be able to access it later. Okay, so what do we have? Project status reports are automated. A lot of us are saying, well, they're not automated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the normal. Normal is still, hey, it's the project manager that's doing the report. Next one is monthly quarterly work. Do you guys do this on a regular basis? Not really, again, it's not a common practice. Do you repurpose the meetings? Yes, excellent. That's one of the ways how you save time, especially when you have endless meetings. We purpose the same meetings for multiple projects like status meetings. Uh, this one, okay, that's good. We don't try to fix people issues with workflow documentation. It's more distributed. Uh, three are in the middle, okay? And then this one's quite distributed. Some PMs provide strategic value, business value, some don't. Okay, back to the why question. So, um, you know, we're looking to reduce waste and complexity via simplification, automation. Um, why? Because projects are, and you may have heard us say this a few times, um, they're increasingly complex, especially when they're uh, interdependent uh, using different methodologies. And so um, let's work on simplifying the doc process, uh, the processes around uh, RPM processes, and also the documentation, as Adam uh, kind of alluded to before, where you should be looking for value uh, and not doing things dogmatically. Um, we also need to optimize the percent of effort allocated to the project execution versus management. So take a hard look. I think that was the second, the second bullet there. Take a hard look at your processes um, on a regular basis. Make it part of your, uh, throw it in your calendar um, and take a step up in terms of um, your abstraction and look at your processes and see um, if you can optimize that. Uh, and then finally, um, again, with the self-evident, but systems are, some, are quite simply better at some things um, than people are. Um, and where that, is the, uh, where that is the case, you should take advantage of it. First record, most of you don't have this problem, so I'm gonna just run through it quickly. This is just one of my pet peeves, is uh, when we try to solve capacity issues or stakeholder grievances or what are other human issues using, hey, can we change the workflow? Can we change the process? Can we change the document? Uh, and over a period of time, we're actually complicating, you increasing complexity becomes unsustainable. The idea here is don't, if it's a problem issue with a person, fix the problem issue with a person, fix the capacity issue, or don't, don't complicate the process basically. Uh, think of it as long term. Long term would be cheaper if you fix the, 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 the person issue. Long term, if you keep using the approach that every time you want to change your process, everybody change your process, or you add section to a document, that section to a document, become unsustainable. Uh, record number two is about purging, simplifying on a regular basis. So most of you said you're not doing this. This is something that I definitely encourage you on a regular basis. In, in Agile, this is done on a regular basis in retrospectives. So just like you would have a post-mortem or just like in, uh, you would have a project review, part of that is 
continuously looking and evolving and simplifying your project processes, approaches, documents. So always purge, always simplify. Um, and that will decrease the complexity that will allow you to mix them better. Simplify, again, that also applies to meetings. So how can we evolve our meetings? On a regular basis, ask yourself, who are we? How can we streamline our meetings? How can we make them more efficient? Are, are these people still relevant to be here? Is it important or is it of value for, for them to be here? Can we combine meetings? And relentlessly minimize operational project activity. So when you're looking at your meetings, you actually want to review and say, how many of them actually allow me to deliver business value, facilitate, promote the ROI, and how many of them are purely operational? And if there are, can we automate them? Can we do them as dashboards? Can we do them as emails? Uh, so people can actually spend on what's time on what's value. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> All right, so third reco. Um, so automation, automate PM activities to get more value from the PM and the PMO. Um, I know that this can come up or can come across as uh, being a uh, potentially threatening topic. So, you know, if you're gonna automate my job, um, what job will I have? Um, and the idea here is it's more around the idea of freeing up as Adam was kind of speaking about in terms of execution and strategic initiatives and whatnot, and not spending your days managing um, operational aspects of the project. Okay, so um, ways you can do that are to automate, as we've already spoken about, automate project initiation processes. So uh, meeting setups, task generation, resource scheduling, um, EP does a really good job of all of these things in terms of like uh, project templates, resource mapping, all of that stuff. Um, automate task and project progress updates. So I think we've spoken at length on this topic. And um, again, it's, it's purely operational. It shouldn't be something that um, you're spending too much of your capacity to do. Speaking of capacity, so automate your capacity planning and your resourcing based on project priority. So um, use a tool to uh to help you with this and automate that um it's it's a completely linear thing you mm -hmm. should not you shouldn't be uh using people to do that and then finally as we've spoken of at length automate all your project reports um it's faster it's more accurate you can um it enables better decision making um and uh you know it's it's not rocket science and uh to my mind there are a lot of side effects or a lot of um, side benefits of going through that practice because it'll force you to look at your processes. It'll force you to look at your data um, in order to produce um, valuable reports and you'll end up with valuable reports. A few slides left, so don't go just yet. I want to thank you for participating in session and trying out this, this slightly different approach. Uh, we have a few pieces of information, including what the next webcast is, but instead of sending you an email to evaluate the session and waiting for 2% of you to respond. We thought, why don't you just do it here? It's way faster. <laughs> so if you could rate the topic, uh, was the session informative? Did you, know, did, did you get good information? Was it engaging? Did you get actionable insight? Did you get value out of this? And then uh, now that you've gone through it, would you share this session with another presentation? If it happened again, would you uh, in invite others? Uh, so this one comes straight forward. I'm going to wait for a few more votes and then we'll talk about the next webcast. Okay, we're doing well. I think there's some Canadians in the, in the audience. <laughs> Everyone's super polite. Okay, uh, so the next webcast is targeted for March 4th. Uh, and we're looking at how digital transformation is changing, we're revolutionizing the practice of project management. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I mean, uh, I think, I hope that everyone uh, found value in the session and came away with, uh, again, something actionable, like you were mentioning at the beginning. So, um, you know, it wasn't all theoretical and high, high minded uh, talk, but it's rather something actionable that they can take away. Um, I'm looking forward to any sort of uh, feedback from, you know, from any customers or, or prospects that are here. Feel free to reach out to me and my team. Um, if you have any further questions, obviously feel free to reach out to Adam about um, any of the ideas that were presented here today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next session.